I've been experimenting recently with tracking different objects over a flat earth map. The results are quite eye-opening, I think. There was a recent video from Eric Dubay who, well, he claimed he was reading uh, an essay by William Carpenter from 1895, but I can't actually find any record of this essay, so I don't know if it's Carpenter's words or Eric's. Either way, they're quite ironic. The astronomers now teach that the sun's distance from the Earth is from 92 to 93 million miles, whereas it is proved to be under 2,400 miles. Modern astronomy and its crafty or most deluded sycophants teach that the sun is stationary and the center of the planetary or celestial bodies, and that it is over one million miles larger than the Earth, whereas it is not one thousandth part of its size. From people who say you shouldn't just believe what you're told to believe and that you should do your own research, comes 10 minutes of random assertions with absolutely no evidence to support them, just claims, opinions, and random memes basically telling people what they should believe. <laughs> but there was one bit in particular that sparked my interest, where they were talking about how seasons would work on a flat Earth. Is constantly moving in spiral orbits round and over the face of the motionless Earth, increasing the latitude of those orbits about 10 or 11 miles every day, from June to December, and decreasing them in the same proportion from December to June. Now, this alone I find quite amusing, because I've seen flat earthers argue that space can't be real, because having an atmosphere next to a vacuum with no barrier would apparently break Newton's second law of thermodynamics but having a sun that can not only drift its orbital path, but also speed up on a larger orbit, directly breaks Newton's laws of motion, unless there are some forces acting up on the sun to repeatedly change its movement and its speed. A force that isn't gravity, since, you know, that apparently doesn't exist. But the bit that really caught my eye was that in both of those clips, the moon remains directly opposite the sun throughout. And this is something I've seen in many different flat earth examples before. Except we've all seen the moon in the middle of the day. So the moon can't remain directly opposite the sun at all times, otherwise we'd only ever see it at night and it would always appear in exactly the same point in the sky at exactly the same time. Now Eric does at least sort of address this by including a very subtle hint of a disclaimer, stating, quote, this does not necessarily represent the exact paths. So I went and mapped it out for myself, and it turns out his disclaimer would have probably been a bit more accurate if it had been worded along the lines of, this isn't even close to accurate. Now, the great thing about all of this is anyone with just a little bit of time can map these things out for themselves, there are plenty of websites and apps out there that track and map out the positions of where things like the sun and the moon not only are, but have been and will be. So it's very easy to verify, just pick a random time and date in the future, look where the sun and the moon are supposed to be in relation to you, and then at that time go outside and see if they're there or not. Photographers use tools like this all the time to plan out very specific shots. For example, when they want a moon rising up over the horizon and they want people on a hill to be appearing like they're right in front of a big moon, they don't just randomly guess and hope for the best. They use apps like PhotoPills to work out exactly where the moon is supposed to be rising up so that they can make sure that they're standing in exactly the right spot to put whatever subject they want in the foreground to be exactly on the path for the moon's rising. Now, I use the tracker on timeanddate.com, and I looked through the whole of December for this year in six-hour intervals. And you can see, yes, the, the sun is following a pretty stable path around the southern hemisphere, but the moon, the path wavers quite, quite drastically, starts in the north and finishes in the south over the course of the month. So I mapped these out, these six-hour intervals, for about the first three weeks of December. And yes, at the start of December, at 10.16 UTC time, the sun and the moon are indeed opposing each other with the sun in the southern hemisphere and the moon in the northern hemisphere, just like Eric's clip suggests. But once they start moving, it becomes very apparent that the moon's path 
isn't consistent, and even its speed is appearing to change, with the sun actually gradually catching up to it and then eventually passing it. It becomes even more apparent if you look at the four-week intervals. This is a map showing the sun and the moon's position at 10.16 UTC time every four weeks, starting from the beginning of January 2022 until around summer 2023. And you can see the sun at 1016 is always directly over Africa, but it varies in latitude, which is explained on a flat Earth model by the sun's orbit changing and is explained on a globe by the Earth's tilt varying. But the moon at 1016 not only changes latitude, but also longitude. It follows a wave which can be explained on a globe by the fact that the moon is orbiting the Earth on a different orbital plane than the Earth is orbiting the sun. So their positions relative to each other can vary. Not quite sure how it's explained on a flat Earth though, since it would require the sun and the moon to not only have forces acting upon them to vary their paths and speeds, but they have to be completely different forces because the paths aren't even the same. I'm sure they'll just chalk it down to being a projector or something. So I then looked at the International Space Station. Now I know flat earthers will argue that the ISS is fake and it doesn't actually exist. But again, you can easily test this. There's trackers that tell you where and when it should pass you by and you can go outside and see it pass you by. Again, photographers use the trackers like this to plan out the shots to know when the ISS will be transiting in front of the moon or even the sun. Hell, flat earthers have even done this. Geronism did it a few years ago. Claimed the ISS was fake, used a tracker to work out exactly where and when it should pass in front of the moon. My alarm went off on my phone and I knew I had 10 seconds. I counted down on my head. Three, two, one. I remember waiting, like what? And then sure enough, there it was. And then later deleted the video. Even everyone's favorite flat earther, Bob Nodal, has admitted the ISS exists is this will tell you you're, you're able to enter in your location, your zip code, whatever, and it will tell you when the ISS is going over you and it's going to, where it's going to rise, how long it's going to stay uh, in your visual sight, and when and where it's going to set. It tells you everything you would need to know to be able to spot this ISS light in the sky. During a live talk on stage, he was doing all about how the ISS doesn't exist. Now, our Glober opponents would love to tell us, and they would love to validate NASA by saying things like, I know the ISS is real. I've seen it with my own eyes. It's absolutely there. You can't deny it. We can take pictures of it. It's there. You guys are just idiots, right? He even then asked a room full of flat earthers if they've seen it as well. Witnessed an ISS transit over the top of you. So show of hands. All right, well, quite a few, quite a few of you. And like I said, if you haven't, you can see Spot the Station. You can go and do this for yourself. Thanks, Bob. So regardless of whether or not you think the ISS that's shown on the live streams from NASA is real or not, seems we're all in agreement that there is something orbiting up there that is shaped like the ISS and sits closer to the Earth than the Moon is, and it appears in the skies exactly where and when the track is stated will. So I went to try and plot out the tracking positions for the ISS onto a flat Earth model. A little bit more complex, to be fair, than the Sun or the Moon, because it's got a much shorter orbit time, and it covers a, a much greater area of the Earth's surface on a given day. Fortunately, though, I was able to find a fantastic video that's modelling the ISS's orbit over both a globe and a flat plane done by Janosch Gaia. I do apologize if I've just butchered that name, but it's the ISS tracked over the course of about five days and displayed on both a rotating globe and the flat Earth. Now, you can see the globe's path. The ISS is orbiting in a straight line, but it's slightly off of the Earth's axis of rotation, which is causing it to drift over which part of the Earth's surface it's, it's orbiting as the Earth rotates. But flat earthers say the Earth doesn't spin. So I've corrected the flat Earth video to keep the flat Earth static, and this is the path that the ISS takes. 
I have no idea what forces could be at play to cause that sort of a spiralling orbit, unless the firmament is literally a giant kid's spirograph set. And again, with huge speed-ups required to cover the arc of the Southern Hemisphere. I mean, maybe, maybe the Earth's like a giant Mario Kart and there's big speed boost ramps up there, I don't know. The Southern Hemisphere is certainly a giant thorn in the side of the Flat Earth ideology, though. Speaking of which, we come to the final segment, which is long-haul flights. Now, Flat Earthers have long claimed that there are no direct flights around the Southern Hemisphere, and that you have to take stopovers in the Northern Hemisphere, and that somehow proved the Earth was flat because it was really them flying in a straight line. Now, I know the topics of long-haul flights have been covered by others before, but I found three flights of particular interest that basically circumnavigate the entire Southern Hemisphere. Latham Airlines flights uh, LA-800 and 801 fly regularly between Australia and Chile, with a stopover in New Zealand. So it flies non-stop from Auckland to Santiago, Chile, and then the same again on the way back, and then carries on to Sydney. Then from Sydney, you can jump on Qantas flights QF-63 and 64 that fly directly to and from Johannesburg. Now, while there are no flights from the country of South Africa over to South America, you can take a 1,500-mile road trip from Johannesburg to Luanda in Angola, which is still south of the equator, and from there, you can take Angola Airlines flight DT-747 or 748 to Sao Paulo, Brazil, which is only a 1,600-mile road trip back to Santiago, Chile. And again, each of those flights can be found on trackers and checked, you could go to the airports if you want to make sure the planes exist. I mean, you could just get on the plane while you're there. There's even amateur plane spotters who've got videos of some of the flights taking off and landing at different airports. Now, that in of itself, I know, doesn't directly disprove the flat Earth, but it does disprove the claim that you can't fly around the Southern Hemisphere. Where it kind of presents a problem for the flat Earth is the distance and the flight times. Those three flights combined total 32 hours. Now, mapped out on a globe, the total flight distance travelled is 15,500 miles, which averages out at about 480 miles an hour. Pretty average cruising speed for a commercial aircraft. On a flat Earth, though, the total distance to follow that same path is 46,500 miles, which equates to an average cruising speed of 1,457 miles an hour. Kind of impressive, considering there are no current commercial aircraft that are capable of breaking the sound barrier of 767 miles an hour. Of course, you could argue that the planes don't really follow the routes that the trackers state that they are, and instead take the most direct route secretly. But even that still totals 37,000 miles. Now, you might get away with doing that on the New Zealand to Chile or the Angola to Brazil flights because you're pretty much all over ocean anyway. Australia to Johannesburg, not so simple. Because the stated route for that is that you fly from Sydney, you go southwest straight out over the ocean, and then you don't see land again until you pretty much reach Johannesburg. To do it on a flat map, though, to take a direct route, you'd have to take off from Sydney fly northwest over the whole of Australia, then cross the Philippines and Thailand and India, down the coast of Somalia, and then cross the whole of Mozambique for good measure. And I kind of think someone on board might have noticed. I mean, what can I say? I know for most flat earthers, all of this will probably be in one ear, dismissed straight out the other, but it's still fun to discuss it, I think. And who knows, maybe it will find its way to some people who genuinely are on the fence about the shape of the Earth. I don't know. Either way, that is going to conclude this particular video. Leave your thoughts in the comments down below. While you're down there, if you enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe button. And then hopefully, we'll see you in the next video.